The next day was rather chaotic, to say the least. My mother decided that it would be a good idea to call me in the middle of my work and be a demeaning dictator. Hiding in the gas station's bathroom, I answered my phone. The conversation went like this. Young lady, why did you wish me a happy birthday? She shouted, the poodles barking in the background. Because I was busy and you did not do that with mine about five months ago, I said. I gave you life and this is how you treat me? She said, crying at the other end. Look, I'm sorry, it's just that I have a lot going on at my end, okay? Uh, I replied, exhaling a sigh. I hated when she had put on this guilt-tripping act on me. You're nothing without me, Lenore Stein! She screamed. I lost patience and muttered two simple words. Shut up! My mother gasped for a moment and raved. You don't talk to me like that! I raised you and kept a roof over your head! I divorced your dad and protected you from beatings! You did nothing about those and made excuses for them, I said in defense. The conversation took a different turn the moment Leslie barged into the stall and seized the phone from my hand. The gesture surprised me, let alone to see Maggie outside of the stall, hands on her hips with a cross expression on her face. Leslie had a casual, yet a hit of intimidation to his tone, as he said, Hello, Miss Stan, is it? Yeah, I have a few things I would like to say to you. Who is this? I'm talking to my daughter here. No, you are speaking to me, Leslie Spinali. I heard you were talking to her. You look my shitty dad. That's just because I'm gay that he gets to treat me like I'm a black sheep. I don't know where you got against Honor, but I can tell you need some mental help. She did tell me that she threw her skirts in the trash after your divorce? What? You don't like competition, lady? Th th that's none of your business! It is my business. Now after I got the truth out of her. Seriously, you saw a circus and a train wreck. The no helped me get my shit together. Uh, something that you know nothing about about your own kid. I was moved deeply by him protecting me like this and could only blink in my shock. My turn to talk to this bitch, Maggie said with an outstretched hand. I watched Leslie relay the phone to her hand and Maggie give the following speech. I have a few things to say to you. One, I probably know Lenore better than you. I tell her what to do and she does her work without complaint. Oh, Apple Dump that cheers me up and she saved me from choking once. Two, I could call the cops on you for people sudden harass me. Last point to make is I may now catch you on my gas station. A few moments of silence passed and I heard the phone beep. Damn, little bitch hung up, she complained. I could hardly believe what had passed and managed to say softly, Thank you. Maggie approached and lifted me off the floor into a hug and said, She's not a little problem anymore, Lynn, then. I don't care if you're spooky. I wish you were my kid instead of hers, but you can be if you want to. I hugged her in return, resting my head on her shoulder. I would love that, I said, trying to contain my tears. Yeah, yeah, you need some ice cream sometimes, too, she said affectionately, patting my back. Hey, I'll count tips first. Leslie objected with a pouting face and crossing his arms. What? Maggie said in confusion. Okay. I mean, I had to depart more than yours have lately. <laughs> hey, who cares about gender norms nowadays? You two could share either way, I said having a chuckle. It was flattering to see them argue over me, but I had to offer a compromise to maintain harmony. The two moms glared into each other's eyes, eventually nodded, and agreed to share custody. We left the bathroom and continued to do our shift at work. I seemed to have performed my task with a little bit of bounce to my step and vigor, which seemed strange for our regular customers to observe. The moment of happiness shifted to a slight unease while I had been sweeping the floor with a popcorn mess that had been left behind by a rude little girl. It was not the mess that had disturbed me, but rather an old song that had played on the radio. The song was called This Maniac's In Love With You by the artist 
Alice Cooper. Its lyrics made me think of Spectre in a strange sense. He is somewhat like a stalker, but I'm not entirely certain on whether his intentions are good or bad, though he is rather charismatic in his ways. I can give him that much credit. Firm hands gripped my hips, which caused my breath to hitch, and I heard his voice speak in my ear. I have taken care of your tyrant of a mother, my dear. Really? What did you do? I asked in a soft whisper. Fortunately, the store is empty of customers for the time being. I have caused her to fall into a puddle of mud in front of her socialite friends. He seemed to have indulged my savage side, and I could not help but have a few suppressed chuckles at my mother's expense. <laughs> Thank you for doing that, Spectre, I said. The next gesture took me off guard by feeling his fingers comb through my hair and the palm rest on my cheek. I have always wanted to hear your laughter. Thank you for granting me this wish. An invisible thumb stroked the bottom of half of my lip, which raised pleasant goosebumps beneath my flesh. The hands and heart quivered while experiencing these sensations. Oh, you are trembling. Let me kiss you to make it all better. Please? I said, giving in to my crush on him. Invisible lips met mine in a gentle peck, which I could not help but close my eyes to enjoy this romantic moment. The lips withdrew, and he said softly, I love you greatly, Lenore Stein. You will be able to see me better upon Halloween, which is within a week's time from now. I shall help you overcome this necromantic grudge. We must travel to the state of Alabama, more will be revealed soon. You are quite the little fighter, like your foremother before you. I must part for now, my dear. Your grandfather is here to see you. After his cryptic speech, I watched the door swung open by itself, and it seemed to indicate that's how he left the store. Spectre, you have a bad habit of leaving me speechless. A moment passed and I heard my grandfather's gruff voice roar out a rant, followed by a loud thump on the outside of the store's wall. The commotion had certainly been brought to Leslie and Maggie's attention as we approached the glass door to peer outside. It bothered me to see him in his enraged glory while he had his office clothes be disheveled and covered in sweat, the red necktie being hung loosely around his neck and white-colored short-sleeved shirt splattered with oil along with his Gray slacks. Poor Grandpa was angry about having a flat tire, which resulted in him throwing the damaged thing to the store. Who the hell is this guy? Maggie asked, being surprised. My grandfather, I groaned out, putting a palm to my face while shaking my head with a sigh. Wait a minute, Dot. You mean to tell me the silver fox having a testosterone fit and chasing a tire is your grandfather? Leslie asked, being dumbfounded, then commented. You's come from good stock, Lenny. <laughs> I blushed in embarrassment and asked, Do you want to flirt with him? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you could call me a hot grandma. I stuck my tongue out at him, which caused him to ruffle my hair. Smoothing my hair down, I stepped outside to greet him. Hey, Grandpa, it's good to see you. How long has it been? I said, hoping my cheerful tone would ease his bad mood. His mood shifted from angry to being flabbergasted as he dropped the tire iron upon the ground with a loud clatter. It has been ten years, little darling. Come here. He said with glee, opening his arms as an invite for a hug. He and I have always been fond of one another, and it made me feel like a child again and hug him close. Oh, I missed you. You've grown so big, he exclaimed, while embracing me in a tight squeeze. I missed you too, Grandpa. <laughs> I said while laughing. He settled me upon the ground, then pointed at my chest and said firmly, Those had better not be implants. No, they're not, I said, blushing furiously. Those look like double D, young lady. You better be telling me the truth. He said, narrowing his eyes into mine. These are all mine, and I do not owe it to a plastic surgeon, I said with a assuring tone. Well, uh, well, uh, well, that's good. 
because I don't want you going nuts with that stuff. I've seen models get it botched. You don't need some plastic in you to make you beautiful, you understand? He said, being authoritative. Most people would be afraid of him because of his scowl-piercing stare and bushy eyebrows, but I knew he said out of love and concern in his own harsh way. Yes, sir, I said. That's a good girl. You always listen. And that's respectful. Did you come all this way just to see me? Well, uh, yes and no. I cannot stay here long. His expression shifted to concern, which he held my hand between his own, the voice having a serious tone as he spoke. I did not tell you this before at all, but, um, our family's cursed. This is going to sound like some weird mystical shit, but I am telling you the truth here. I came all this way to give you this. He paused to open the rear passenger door and withdraw a small crate sealed by a lock. I received the crate into my hands and watched him place an old key on top of it. What's inside will explain everything. Stay safe, Lenore. I love you so much. He said and placed a kiss upon my forehead. I watched him enter his car and drive away from the gas station. That brief reunion was very weird. What is in the box? Why not just tell me right away before leaving? All I can say is that my entire situation is leading me to have more questions that are left unanswered.